Good afternoon. Um, so, so I think it's uh, fair to say that most of the microbial cells on this planet belong to genera uh, for which there are no cultured representatives. Uh, majority, it might be, you know, it's been quoted as saying maybe as many as 80% or more. So if you realize that most of the organisms have no cultured representatives and you want to know about metabolism, um, it would help to bring them into culture. So there are certainly other ways to, to study metabolism, but certainly having organisms in culture is one of the best ways. Now, it's also likely, I would argue, that if there are so many organisms um, that are not yet in culture, um, that perhaps some of those are doing metabolisms we have not yet discovered, so we don't yet know about. Um, so the idea of finding new metabolisms, I think, is a pretty exciting one. And predicting what those metabolisms might be is certainly one approach, and then to look for those organisms. Uh, one way to predict new metabolisms is to use energetics. Um, and this is something that has been done before, and that's what I'm going to be using in my presentation today. Um, before I get too deeply into this, I want to make sure that I uh, say just briefly why I'm using catabolism rather than metabolism. Metabolism is sort of a catch-all phrase that most people often use in place of catabolism. But here we really mean the energy-yielding reaction, the, the reactants going into the organism, the organism doing its thing, giving off waste products, and the energy yield from that overall catabolism methanogenesis being an example, aerobic respiration being an example, separate from biomass synthesis uh, inside the cell, which would be anabolism. So I will try to be consistent with catabolism, but like I said, some people just end up using metabolism to mean catabolism. All right, so the best example, I think, in using energetics to predict metabolisms, and I think most people know about this one, um, is from Broda in 19, 1977. Um, the energetics were not quite done right, but it didn't matter in this case. Um, but in the 77 papers, a two-page paper that had a huge influence, um, he basically wrote that ammonium plus nitrite going to um, dinitrogen gas in water has a negative delta G0, or here written as delta G0 prime, of minus 80 kilo, 86 kilocalories. So multiply that by 4.1 to get it into joules. So the argument basically was, hey, there's a large negative sign on this delta G. There must be an organism out there doing it. Well, it took almost 20 years until um, Heis Kuhnen's group at the University of Delft determined that this process was in fact happening and it was in fact happening um, by being mediated by microorganisms. Um, and then it took another, you know, about 10 years or so before Marcel Kuypers at the Max Planck Institute found that Animox, which was then later termed, um, was actually a very common process in natural environments. And now we talk about it all the time as if we always knew it existed. But in 77, it was a thermodynamic prediction. So I want to use that same approach and, and think about a few other new metabol or potentially new metabolisms. So going back to this Animox idea, um, you see there in that green circle in the middle, that's basically what Baroda based his prediction on. And a couple of things here to note. One is that, of course, um, thermodynamics, or in this case, um, delta G calculations are temperature dependent. So in some cases, the temperature dependence is pretty minor. In some cases, it's pretty good, um, or meaning pretty pretty dominant. Um, sometimes the, you know, the curve goes down, sometimes goes up. So um, we need to think about um, energetics in terms of temperature as well as pressure, but pressure is a little bit less of an effect unless you get to really high pressures. All right, so a temperature dependent function. The other thing to think about is that it's, um, Broda used that little circle above the delta G, so use only a standard state energetics. Again, with Animox, it didn't really matter. Um, but in reality, we want to use the chemical environment to really get at the real energetics. And that's that Q term on the right-hand side of the equation. So I've got up here a low energy and a high energy example. So let me just walk through that really briefly. The low energy example, so that blue curve, means that there's very low concentrations of ammonium, very low concentrations of nitrites, so all the things on the left-hand side, and high concentrations of the product, so something like maybe 0.78 bars of nitrogen, like atmospheric. That would be a low energy example. A high energy example would be opposite, high ammonium, high nitrite, um, low N2 content. And you can see that the chemistry, and this is not just randomly picking the most extreme numbers, these are geochemically reasonable concentrations that I've chosen to put into the low energy or high energy example. The point is that there's a temperature dependence and there's a, there can be quite a big um, dependence on the energetics coming from the chemical environment. All right, so that's Animox. Now here um, I've got three examples of 
either unknown or little known potential, always remember, remember these are potential metabolism, so a catabolism, sorry. So in this case, it's a ferric iron mineral um, or mixed um, iron valence state mineral magnetite um, being reduced with hydrogen to make ferrous iron um, and then protons and water to balance the reaction. So delta GR0 um, sitting there at about minus 100 kilojoule with not much of a temperature dependence. Now I want to introduce briefly this, this prime next to the delta G0, right? So this is known as the biological standard state, and lots of people know what this is. For those who don't, it basically says that the system is at neutrality. So the proton, at least at 25 degrees, would be at 10 to the minus 7 instead of the one molar or one molal unit that's used generally for standard states. So you can see here there are six protons in the reaction, and if you go from one molar to 10 to the minus 7, seven orders of magnitude raised to the sixth power, yeah, that's going to have an effect on your energetics. So that's why that curve moves up by over 100 kilojoules um, in this example. If you consider the low energy example that I mentioned before, again, that would mean in this case, low concentration of protons, or in other words, a basic system, high pH system, um, low hydrogen concentrations and high ferrous iron, that's where the energetics would be and would be above zero, endergonic, not a good um, potential metabolism or catabolism. However, if you consider an environment that's acidic, so high proton activity, high hydrogen, low ferrous iron, then you can actually see that there would be somewhere on the order of minus 50 to minus 20 kilojoules per mole of electron transferred over this temperature range. So certainly in the low temperature range in an acidic environment with high hydrogen, this is a potential catabolism. Here's another example. Um, so this would be a new type of methanogenesis, if you want to think of it that way. CO2 and ammonium going to methane and N2. Again, protons and water to balance the reaction. The delta G0 is incredibly boring here as a function of temperature. It doesn't do much. It's sitting there at about 13 and a half, 14 kilojoules per mole electron transferred. If we then again consider the biological standard stage, you know, huge effect again. Again, there are eight protons in the reaction, so changing it from one molar to 10 to the minus 7, um, and then raising it to the eighth power has a huge effect. Um, what about when you also then include the, the environment? Um, I'm not showing the low energy example here because it was endergonic, so above that, that zero line the whole way. Um, but at high CO2, high ammonium, low N2 and low protons, so again, um, in a basic or like alkalic system, there is a small amount of energy here. Now I want to remind people these reactions are written, or the energetics are written in terms of kilojoules per mole electron transferred. So these are all normalized to that. The reaction as written here is a 24 electron um, transfer reaction. So for this reaction, you'd have to multiply the energetics by 24. And then you would see that there's you know, quite a bit of energy to be had for this potential catabolism. Um, so the one I want to really focus mostly on, the one we're most excited about, is this one here. Um, so this is called sulfur com proportionation. Um, lots of people don't know that term, but people have certainly heard the term sulfur or other or uh, other element disproportionation. So that would be the back reaction here. All right, let's start with sulfur disproportionation. Elemental sulfur intermediate oxidation state going to something more reduced sulfide and more oxidized sulfate. People know that the back reaction happens and the organisms that can do that, but the back reaction has a positive delta G zero. So again, it's, a, it's just evidence that the chemistry of the system absolutely is essential in getting the energetics right. We're interested in the forward reaction as written here, comproportionation, sulfide plus sulfate, um, protons for the balancing to make elemental sulfur. Um, delta G0 for this reaction, again, not very temperature dependent, sitting down there at about minus 120. Um, if you wanted to con you know, consider the biological standard state, that's what it would look like as a function of temperature. Um, again, the low energy example won't work, um, but in a system of high sulfide, high sulfate, and low pH, um, this is a potential catabolism. Um, you know, especially at low temperature, minus, you know, in the zero to 50 degree range, let's say. Um, this is the same reaction, but plotted slightly differently. Um, so pH on the y-axis going from zero to seven, temperature just up to 100 degrees, and then color-coded basically on these um, temperature um, profiles with a dark blue, minus 50 kilojoules, and the greens, minus 30, the yellows, minus 10, and the yellow to white transition being equilibrium. 
So you can see here again that um, you know in the in the acidic range, pH one, two, three, somewhere in that neighborhood, and there's certainly plenty of acidophiles that can handle that. Um, in environments with low high sulfide, high sulfate, um, this would be an energy yielding reaction and energy yields that are not unreasonable. Um, 10, 20, 30, 40 kilojoules, we heard um, from Sanjay this morning, um, that sort of 10 kilojoules per mole is often a cutoff. Anything more than that might be reasonable. And here we're certainly dipping into the 30 to 50 kilojoule per mole range. Um, so what kind of environments might you find this, uh, meta this catabolism or metabolism in? Um, so that's sort of the, the next step. You predict a new metabolism, then you go hunt for them. And my graduate student, um, uh, Heidi uh, Aronson, is going to be going off to the Frasasi cave system with Jen McElady in about two weeks to hunt for these organisms. Um, so why Frasasi? Well, it's an environment where there's, uh, it's a cave system in northern Italy. Uh, it's, a, it's a cave system where there's gypsum, so sulfate minerals precipitating. Um, there's the smell of hydrogen sulfide. Um, in the cave and they've measured pHs as low as 1 and 2. So that's the kind of environment that, that would seem to be ideal for this. But it's not the only kind. Um, shallow sea hydrothermal systems where I've worked for quite a while um, might also be good hunting grounds. You have a marine system, so generally high sulfate. You have volcanic gases, including sulfurous gases, coming into the system, high sulfide in many cases. We've measured 2 to 2.5 two volume percent um, H2S in the gas phases of the gases, uh, in the gas phase. Um, some of the systems can be quite acidic. That might work. Um, acid mine drainage sites um, might also have some combination of the high sulfate, high sulfide, low pH that would make them attractive, acid sulfate crater lakes, um, and so on and so forth. So again, sort of just to, 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 to drive this point home, we're looking um, strictly from a chemical, geochemical, thermodynamic standpoint, are there redox reactions which under certain reasonable geochemical environments would be uh, have would have a de delta G that's that's negative, um, and would it have a delta G that's negative enough um, to then start using that as a um, as sort of a first step in looking for um, organisms? Then the hard part really begins: getting the samples, bringing them into a lab, trying to culture them, and, and so on and so forth. So this is absolutely not saying these metabolisms or catabolisms exist or that these organisms exist, is really just the first step. It's very analogous to Broda saying, hey, here's Anamox, maybe there's something out there. I'm hoping it won't take 20 to 30 years until we find these. I'll be dead. Um, but um, you know, it would be nice if maybe you know, in, the, in, the, in, in the meantime we could find them a little bit more quickly than we did for Anamox. But remember, Anamox is nitrogen comproportionation. So sulfur comproportionation should not be that weird a concept. And with that, I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Thanks. We have time for a few questions for Jan. So I got a quick question for you, Jan. Yeah. So are these, so when you're going out looking for these organisms that might be conducting these metabolisms, the comproportionation, et cetera, are these uh, primarily incubation-based analyses? That's certainly where we're starting. So what, what Heidi has done is used the chemistry of the system, in this case the Frasasi cave system, based on previous um, studies, uh, analyses, to design growth media that mimic as closely as possible the system. But we actually don't mimic perfectly. We do give it a sort of a little extra boost. We give it perhaps a little bit more sulfate or a little bit more sulfide or, you know, vary the pH a little bit more than we might find in nature. So it's not just saying um, exactly the things we've measured is, is the medium we're using, uh, but it's based on that and then just initially at least giving them a little bit extra push by giving them a little bit more of the reactants than maybe is in the system and then perhaps, you know, playing off of that. Yeah. But yeah, it's culture based at first. Pete. Thanks, Jan. That's super cool. I, um, <laughs> I think that if um, you're staying alive means not finding these, then a bunch of us are going to try to avoid finding them. <laughs> the, um, so, uh, so I have a question for you. Uh, it's a, forgive me if it's a bit out there, but I am curious. How do you think this plays out in terms of the prevalence of comproportionation over evolutionary time? Like uh, in, in a point in time where we ne may not have had these oxidized sulfur species, right, or nitrogen species? Do you, do, do you, I mean, is it too heavy-handed to assert that this might be a slightly younger 
metabolic capacity? Do you see where I'm going with this? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, if you didn't have sulfate, you're not going to have sulfur comproportionation, right? So would you have had sulfate until the system was, um, you know, quite oxidized? Would it would it have been, you know, sulfate after the sort of rise of oxygen, if you will? Um, it, it, because it requires, for the sulfur example, quite high concentrations of sulfate, um, as opposed to the, the, the Animox example, that may be the case. So we have not thought about, it. we're not saying that these are necessarily early metabolisms or anything like that. Um, it would be fun to play around with that idea. Um, I think for Animox, it's not a problem because nitrite or nitrate are better electron acceptors than sulfate is, so which means to, in order for there to be energy, there has to be quite a lot of sulfate for this to work. Not the case with, with nitrogen species.